Access Credit Union has always been at the heart of our community through good and bad times. We want to continue to play our part in helping our community through the COVID-19 crisis. As businesses reopen, we encourage our community to work together by staying local, borrowing locally and spending locally. Access Credit Union is here to help. Close your eyes and pull like a <laughs> And a new Irish record for Phil Healy, 22.99. Christy Cooney hands over the Sam McGuire Cup to Graham Canty, Cork All-Ireland Champions for the seventh time ever. Hello and welcome to the Star Sport Podcast. My name is Jack McCarran of the Southern Star and I'm joined as always by Star Sport Editor Kieran McCarthy. Before we kick things off this week, I'd just like to give a gentle reminder to our listeners and viewers to please rate, review and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. On today's podcast, we'll be chatting to Kinsale and Cork footballer Orla Finn, who's making her third appearance on the show. Orla was speaking recently at the launch of a partnership between the GAA and the Marketing Hub to produce a lifestyle clothing collection for GAA fans, which will be marketed through www.ganzi.ie. And she caught up with Kieran ahead of the start of the championship and Cork's huge clash with Kerry on November 7th. We'll also be joined by Gavin Casey from the 42. .ie to chat about Munster's win over the Cardiff Blues on Monday evening. There was a strong West Cork flavour to the fixture, with no less than five players from the region involved, so we'll chat to Gavin about the growing West Cork influence at Thoman Park. But Kieran, it's 25 years since Bantry Blue won the club's first ever Cork senior football title, and in this week's paper, you have a special feature marking the occasion. When reading it earlier, one quote that really stood out to me was from Des McCauley, and he says... We used to grind teams down and in the last five minutes every 50-50 ball became a 70-30 in our favour. That alone says a lot about what kind of team this Bantry team were. This is one of the most enjoyable pieces I've written this year, Jack. Like you said, it's 25 years since Bantry Blues won the 1995 Cork Senior Football title and that was, was Bantry's first ever county senior football title and they weren't tipped to win it that year they kind of they were surprise packets but they they beat every team in front of them um they beat them because they had some superb footballers in their ranks led by the captain Damien O'Neill and they had Kevin Harrington, Podrick O'Regan and a and a couple of more well a lot more but as well as that their fitness levels were off the chart um Dr Dennis Cotter the late doctor who who passed away last year he was manager of the team and he assembled this superb backroom team that included Sean McGrath, who, who we brought in as a coach. And Sean McGrath would go on to um, do great things with the car colours in years after. But everyone I spoke to said that that Bantry Blues team at the time was well ahead of their time. Kind of yeah, just, on, just on that point, Kieran, uh, let's just pause for a second there. In your piece that's going to be available for everyone to read in Thursday's Southern Star, Porrick O'Regan, who was interviewed for the piece, says... I was involved with Cork and what we were doing with Bantry then, Cork weren't even doing. We were years ahead of everyone else. So like that's in 1995. What sort of things were they doing? Like it was even down to the auditor individual fitness tests at the start of their at the start of October 1994. So there was blood samples taken, urine samples taken, they were testing for the iron levels. Um Dr. Cotter got an osteopath down, there was a psychologist available, there was VO2 max tests. They were telling me that they were even getting Jaffa cakes and digestives before it even became involved, you know, kind of that was the level of preparation that Dr. Cotter and his backroom team put into that Bantry team. So when so Arson when, when Arson Wenger was getting all the credit over in the Premier League for introducing sports science in the early nineties, Dr. Dennis Cotter was doing this exact same thing down at Bantry. Hundred percent Bantry were, were well ahead of their time and they had such a good winter's training program in ninety four. By the time they got on the pitch in early ninety five, they were hopping off the ground. And like you read that quote earlier from Des McCauley, they just felt whenever whenever it came to game that they had the football ability and that they were fitter and stronger than any other team. So when it came when it came to the crunch, when it came to the last ten minutes, they just kept going at that real top pace. So while other teams waned a bit or maybe got tired, Bantry just kept going to the final whistle and it showed throughout the the 95 county championship campaign there was three or four games there that they won it in the last 10 minutes including the county final including the county semi-final against Duhello 
including the county quarterfinal replay against Carberry. So that that huge fitness levels and that preparation served them well. But like we said as well, Jack, they had some superb footballers in that team. Yeah, and one of the players you mentioned a little earlier on was club captain Damian O'Neill, who in the piece, Porrick O'Regan says, was almost like a Roy Keane figure. He demanded a lot from everyone. So that's obviously the kind of leadership that you need to win county finals. Porrick O'Regan was telling me that he was half afraid of Damian O'Neill back then, and he's still half afraid of him now. He said... Um, Damien O'Neill was a leader in every sense. He was the main man in that Bantry team. He'd captained the Cork under 21s to the All Ireland in 94. He was a Cork minor that won an All Ireland in 1990. He was just a born leader. And like Ray Keane, he set the standard. So if other fellas didn't meet that standard in training or in a match, Damien O'Neill wasn't long telling them, lads, well, in Florio language to this, put up your shorts and cop on, you know, kind of. Um, it was Des McCauley was telling me that that he had hands like shovels. And he said in in their pre-match huddles, Damon O'Neill would go around hitting fellas in the chest to try to get them going. And it was a, the will of God that these fellas didn't kind of capsize to the floor and fall down because he was such a force in nature, Damon O'Neill. And he really led this team. And we talk about a captain leading by example. He was man of the match in the 95 county final against Musgrave. So not only did he talk the talk, even though he wasn't a great man for interviews, um, but he, he certainly walked the walk. And, Bentry had this unbelievable player who led them led them to glory. And it's it's just a shame, Jack, in a way that that Cork fans in general didn't get to see the best of Damien O'Neill. I think he three cruciates. You know, he was dogged by cruciate injuries after that. Um Bentry went on to win the county title as well in ninety eight. But Cork fans in general didn't get to see the best of Damien O'Neill at inter county level. This was an era as well, Kieran, that West Cork clubs were absolutely dominating the county scene, weren't they? Hundred percent. Um you had Castle Haven in 89, you had Skib winning in 92, and then they went on to win the All-Ireland. You had Castle Haven again uh, winning a county title. Clannock Hill team, Beira were, were top teams at the time. So it was a really rich time for, for, for West Cork teams. And Bantry just came up out of intermediate 93. So they were the new kids in the block, kind of. Like 95 was just their second season at um, back at senior football. And in 94, they lost the quarterfinal to Skibbereen. And they actually lost it in the last 15, 20 minutes. They kind of kept with Skib for a certain amount, but then Skib just pulled away. But it just shows the preparation that Bantry put in for the 95 campaign, that not only could they live with these teams, but they outlasted them too. And um, when they got to the final against Musgrave, what a couple of players mentioned is it suited them that they were playing Musgrave. It was a divisional team. Musgrave took out Nemo in the other semi-final. And I think Nemo could have maybe caused Bantry Blues a lot more problems in the final but the, the kind of Bantry, the Bantry attitude towards Musgrave is, Jesus, it's just a divisional team. Like they kind of, these fellas don't have the allegiance to their divisional team as we do to kind of to, to, to Bantry Blue. So they felt a lot more confident going in against um, going in against Musgrave. And the proof is in the pudding. They, they won the game and they won the county title and it sparked huge celebrations. Yeah, well, uh, it's an absolutely fantastic piece. I was lucky enough to have a sneak preview of it a little earlier on today. And there's some great photographs in there as well. And it's three pages across the Star Sports section tomorrow. So if you're from Bantry or it's Hinterland, or if you've ever spent any time in Bantry, or you have any connection to the Bantry Blues or West Cork football in, in general, because it is a part, of, a part of the West Cork footballing history, I'd encourage you to get out tomorrow and pick up, or get out on Thursday and pick up a copy of the Southern Star, it'll be available across West Cork and beyond for less than or for two for your two euro twenty. And if you can, if you can't make it to a shop, you can always pick up a copy of the e paper, and that's available for less than two euro per week. Just go on to www.southernstar.ie forward slash e paper. So yeah, get out, buy a copy of that. Uh, we're going to take a quick break now, and coming up then, we're going to chat to Orlefin. Access Credit Union has always been at the heart of our community through good and bad times. We want to continue to play our part in helping our community through the COVID-19 crisis. As businesses reopen, we encourage our community to work together by staying local, borrowing locally and spending locally. Access Credit Union is here to help. On November the 7th, the Cork Ladies Footballers will get their championship campaign Underway with the visit of old rivals Kerry. Ahead of the championship opener, we got a chance to speak to Kinsale's 
Orla Finn, who was speaking at the launch of a partnership between the GAA and the marketing hub to produce a lifestyle clothing collection for GAA fans, which would be marketed through www.ganzi.ie. The clothing collection will feature a wide range of items specifically created for GAA fans in 31 counties, as well as New York and London. For more, check out ganzi.ie. Well, Kieran, how was Orla when you caught up with her? Orla was in good form. Um, just a couple of weeks out from the start of Cork's championship campaign, and she's eager to get going. Um, like you'll hear from her quite soon. She felt at one point that there wouldn't be a championship this year, so she can't wait to get going. Cork will be, well, they have to be one of the favourites this year. Obviously, Dublin are are the team everyone has to beat. But the format of the championship, Jack, um, this this season is different to past seasons of, of because of what's gone on. So Cork are in a group along with Kerry and Kevin. So there's four groups of three. The winner from each group goes straight through to that Ireland semi-final and then obviously on to the final. So it's a very short season. Um, it's effectively knockout because uh, Kevin and Kerry are, are playing this weekend. And let's say, for example, if Kerry beat Kevin... We have Cork and Kerry in on November 7th. So Cork know that they'll, they'll have to beat Kerry because if Kerry win that game, Kerry are true to the, the, top of the table. So it's going to be knockout style from the very start to beat Kerry and Kevin and get through to the semi final. They're on the opposite side to Dublin, which does, does set up a tantalising prospect of a, of, a, of, a, of a Cork Dublin final. And if Cork are to go far, they need Orla Finn firing in all cylinders. She's a two time all star. She's been the leader of the Cork attack the, the last couple of years. Um, with no Emer Skelly, as far as I know, she's not involved with the with the Cork ladies this year. There'll be more onus on on Orla to lead the way. And you, you'll hear her now. She's in good form. She can't wait to get going. And um, I think you could have Orla on for a record four time before the end of the year, Jack, when we're touch wood previewing an All Ireland football final. Delighted to be joined on the Star Sport podcast by Cork footballer Orla Finn. Orla, this is the third time you've appeared on the podcast and I think that's a record number of appearances by any local sports star. So right about now in the kind of post video production, we should be hearing applause in the background, you know, just to congratulate you on achieving this milestone. But um, the last time we spoke was actually back in April during the first lockdown and we're speaking again now and it's the second lockdown. So just to, to check in with you, how, how, how are things keeping? Yeah, it's all been a little bit mad. Um, I suppose the first lockdown seems like a lifetime ago now at this stage. Um, it's great to be back back working again now since September, back at school. School's reopened, so I'm delighted with that. And it's fantastic that the inter-county is going ahead too. Um, I remember when I spoke with you last, I really didn't think that there would be any inter-county championship this year. Um, I was hopeful, but I actually didn't think it would go ahead. And... Now that they're doing a, a winter um, championship, it's going to be something a little bit different, um, which will be nice all the same. Because when we spoke again back in April, we were talking about the possibility of, I suppose, playing GA behind closed doors and, and what's going to happen. And we, we just didn't know, but we're here now a couple of weeks out from throwing. You kind of, you, you know the fixtures, Cork of Kevin coming up, um, Kerry before that. So are you starting to get excited about getting back in the football field with Cork again? Yeah, it's very exciting. We're back training since September. Um, and when we went back in September, I thought it would be, you know, it'd be ages before our first championship game, two months. Um, but time has gone by fairly quickly. So we're all really looking forward now to, to playing Kerry in two weeks' time. Obviously, I, we can't talk about GA without mentioning this whole COVID situation. And it's the reason we're in the in this second lockdown. Um, what are your own thoughts about GA going ahead this winter? Are you looking forward to playing the championship? Do you think it's the right decision to be playing football? Or? Personally, I'm very happy it's going ahead. And I know some people have different opinions, but I am, um, as a player, very happy it's going ahead. And I think a lot of people will be very happy as well, you know, for something to, to look forward to on the weekend, to watch some of the matches. And for me, it's an escape from the whole COVID thing as well. You know, um, just back to a bit of normality, um, you know, there, there's a lot a lot of people, you know, worried and stuff at the same time. But I think when we're playing and we're out in the field, you know, it's it's supposedly it's a lot harder to pick it up out um, outside anyway. So as long as, as most teams are doing things right off the pitch, that's the main thing. You know, you have to really limit your contacts and stuff. If, if you want to be playing um, in the championship, you really have to try and limit your contacts as much as you can outside of work. Um, and I suppose this this level five lockdown will will force us to to do that anyway. But 
you you really don't want to be coming into championship and having to maybe self isolate for two weeks because you're a close contact. Um, now that could easily happen any of us, but if you limit your contacts, maybe it, it might help a little bit anyway. With Paul Kerrigan on last week's um, podcast, and I asked him how safe does he feel with all this going on, and he said he feels incredibly safe. You know, kind of, he said just like you said there, kind of players are watching themselves, being kind of limiting their contacts with, with people and so on. So, how safe do you feel, Orla, kind of heading into the championship? Yeah, no, I, I, I'm the same now. I feel safe too. Um, I think if the right things are done, um, you know, outside of the football, that that will be fine. You know, we're all wearing masks in dressing rooms. There's limited numbers allowed in there. A lot of the girls aren't even using the dressing rooms if if they don't need to. You know, if they're living close to the pitch and they can shower and stuff at home. So things are being done the right way, and as long as that happens, you know, I'm happy. We're not too far off from that first game, November 7th against Kerry. And what a game to kick it all off, you know, kind of Cork and Kerry going, going at it again. You, I suppose you, you, just, you just can't wait for that game, can you? Yeah, no, I'm really excited. And as I said, I didn't think there would be a championship this year. And I think that's made me even hungrier for the championship to go ahead. And just there's nothing else going on anyway at the moment. So being able to play, um, being able to play football is just fantastic. Because, like you said, there we're going into the well, we're in the second lockdown, and we're in the winter months too. And it's not like the first lockdown where we go go for a walk in the evening and so on. Like the nights are the nights are darker earlier and so on. So to have football and be able to watch it on TV and to follow the championships over the next couple of weeks, it'll actually give people, I think, a kind of a, a much needed break from the reality of what's happening. Hundred percent, yeah. Because as you said in the in the first lockdown. The weather was extremely good for that time of year as well. Um, and with the longer evenings and, and the brighter mornings, it made it a little bit easier. Now, it will be hard for people going into the dark nights and the early the, the early nights. Um, but I think having that to look forward to at the weekend, and it's something to talk about as well, um, that will keep people pushing through. And I think that might have been part of the government's idea to, to leave the whole championship go ahead, you know, to give that people that little bit um, of excitement and something to look forward to. And we will be talking a lot about this, this Cork and Kerry game. Um, Kerry, in fairness to them, they, they did show signs of improvement when the league was on earlier in the year. I think they were going well in, in Division 2. So what sort of challenge would you be expecting off them? Yeah, Kerry, Kerry are always there, thereabouts. Like, they, you know, you can never be too confident going in against Kerry. Um, they have fantastic players, you know, and I know over the last few years, maybe they just didn't have thing, things right, you know, change of management and stuff. But I, I think, you know, it, it's a match that we'll go into, you know, all guns blazing. Um, and with championship this year, especially, it's knockout. You know, I know we have two group games, but you have to win the two of them to get to a semi-final because they've they've cut out the quarter-final stage. So this year's championship will be really exciting in that regard. Because we've no known form heading into the championship. Like you said, you have to hit form early. You have to find a bit of momentum. A, a team that gets momentum could go very, very far in, in this year's championship. So it's very exciting in that regard that we don't know where teams stand going into this championship. So there could be surprise results. So I suppose the onus is on Cork as favourites against Kerry not to get cut out. That's it, yeah. You never know what's going to happen. And as I say, coming up to a match, you don't know what players you might be without as well. Um you know, hopefully you'd be hoping to have your, your full panel, but you just don't know what's going to be thrown at you maybe the few days before the match. Um, so it really is anyone's game this year, I think, anyone's championship. Um, I think mentally we're going to have to be strong um, to pull us through it. Um, I know Kerry are going to be very physical and, and fit as always. So it's just, it's a game I'm really looking forward to. And the reason we're talking to you as well today, Orla, obviously you were helping launch Genzi, this, this brand new, exciting kind of lifestyle GA wear that um, you're obviously modding one, one of the tops there now. It's, um, tell us a small bit about Genzi and, and um, the gear and yeah, so it's on. Just a, a lifestyle collection. It's the first GA lifestyle collection. Um, it's just something different really from, from the usual jerseys and stuff that people buy and wear. It's, it's mainly for the fans. Um, and I think a lot of a lot of people will will really love something just a little bit different. Um, you can get t-shirts, hoodies, and wall stickers. Um, and the gear is available in children's, uh, men's, and women's sizes as well. And they're available to order um, online from today. It's actually an ideal Christmas present. So I can imagine all all of your friends and family will be expecting Genzi gear under their Christmas tree this this Christmas. 
That's it, yeah, it's their lucky. <laughs> but no, absolutely delighted to talk to you, Orla. Kind of like we said there, it's um, it's great that we're actually back talking about football again. It's, it's something to look forward to. So the very, very best over the next couple of weeks. Thanks a million, Kieran. Great stuff right. there from Orla, as always. Now, before we chat to Gavin Casey of the 42. I just want to pause for a minute to chat to our friends at Access Credit Union. The Star Sport Podcast is, of course, brought to you by Access Credit Union, your trusted local financial partner. Just recently, I went through the process of opening a current account with Access Credit Union, and I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that it's changed my life. I was able to open the account online during lockdown, which made the process completely hassle-free, and it was made even easier by the great support provided by Access Credit Union team leader, Amanda O'Sullivan, who joins me now. Amanda, I understand you can now apply for a credit union loan online as well. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, you can. If you thought applying for your current account was easy, um, you'll be delighted when you come to us for your car loan. Um, You can apply online just as long as you're registered for your online banking. A couple of clicks and it comes to us here in Access Credit Union. The personal touch still isn't lost. We'll still bring you back and discuss the loan with you. Um, and you can upload any supporting documents you needed, your uh, payslips, bank statements, that sort of thing. Um, we attach them here to your loan, assess the loan, and you can draw it down online. So we aim to do that all within 24 to 48 hours, depending on when you submit your documents. Um, and I suppose it was something that was in the pipeline for a while, but with COVID-19, it sped, on, sped us up to, to provide the service. Um, and it's really worked out well for us. And you know, for members being able to access their funds and still draw down their loan, it's been it's been a great asset to us really and to the community. I suppose, yeah, um, typically people always had to come into the credit union to draw down their loan. And, you know, for younger people who may not be living in the area anymore, we were inaccessible then. So now we're back back in the market for these these members again. Um, and hopefully they will they will support us as we are supporting local businesses. And you know, with every 10 euros spent in the locality, it generates 40 euros for the local economy. So in turn, the interest that you're paying on your loan in your local credit union goes back into your local economy. So you know, everyone's helping each other with this. Great stuff. Thanks very much, Amanda. And don't forget, Access Credit Union is your trusted local financial partner. Access your money 24-7 from anywhere in the world with an Access Credit Union current account and enjoy all the benefits while keeping your money local. On Monday night, Munster moved top of Guinness Pro 14 Conference B with an entertaining bonus point win at Thoman Park over the Cardiff Blues. Five West Cork men were involved in the 38-27 win and earlier today we spoke to Gavin Casey of the 42.ie about the growing West Cork influence at Thoman Park. Last Monday night was another memorable night for West Cork Rugby, where we had five local men lining out for Munster in the Pro 14 against the Cardiff Blues. Um, delighted to be joined by Gavin Casey of the 42 to chat about, like we said there, another great night for West Cork Rugby. First off, welcome to the podcast, Gavin. Oh, my pleasure to, to be here, Kieran. I've been reading a lot of the Southern Star while uh, on my Holliers down in Glengariff. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time in Glengariff over the course of the pandemic. My, my mother has a house down there and I've been lucky enough to get down there and decompress a little bit and absolutely love your sports coverage. So once Jack McCarran got on to me asking me did I want to do it, I was very excited to do it. Oh, brilliant. We appreciate your time and hopefully we've kept you entertained in your in your, your, your time in, in, in West Cork. And just like the the West Cork rugby players are keeping everyone entertained but Munster at the moment. Um, I suppose just let's look at that game for a second. Like I said, five West Cork um, players lined out for Munster. We had um, Finneen Witchley, Darren Sweetnam, John Hodnett and Gavin Coombs all starting. And then Josh Witchley came off the bench for his senior debut. Kind of that's a, for one little pocket of Cork to give five players to Munster team. That, 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 that's some achievement, Gavin. So much even for the region and I think the most interesting aspect to it and probably the most remarkable aspect to the success of the region is the fact that the lads you named there um, hail from different corners of West Cork. It's not just one club or one school driving this um, you know, this this kind of remarkable rise. Okay, the Witchley brothers are, are brothers naturally, so they grew up together. That's two of them. But they're from, like, they're credited as being from Bantry often because they play for 
or they played for Bantry Bay RFC and their father Florence was heavily involved there in setting up underage systems years ago but they're from Kumola which is kind of more the, the Balaliki side I suppose of, of Bantry I don't know do they identify properly as Bantry men or Kumola men but you know even for take Kumola in isolation like you'd never really associate it with um the emergence of professional sports people you know it's, it's a small population and, and kind of a, a very rural area um and then you look at say John Hodnett he is a Ross Carberry man um he d- didn't go to say a traditional rugby school uh came through at Clonakilty RFC who've been doing brilliant things in West Cork and for West Cork rugby and he along with the the Wisherleys are, is seen as a bona fide prospect I mean Munster look at this guy and think this could be the answer to a lot of our problems in that we've clearly struggled particularly against Leinster in recent years in having a uh, a lack of dynamism in the pack and, and an inability to compete physically with some of these teams that they come across in European semi-finals, Pro 14 semi-finals, where they can't get over that last four hump. Um, listen, Gavin Coombs then, like, I, I, it's a weird one for me. Gavin, I think, is almost like the most exciting prospect of them. It's difficult to kind of quantify, obviously, but when you look at his physique and again uh, without meaning to overuse the word the dynamism he brings to the the game as a ball carrier it sort of feels like people should be making more noise about him actually um gavin came on he scored or sorry he started the game uh scored two tries could have had a hat trick right at the end uh, it was interesting jack o'donoghue from waterford was the only non-cork man in the pack he got man of the match and there's a, a funny clip that munster put out of jack trying to drape the man of the match medal over gavin coombs uh, around his neck because he felt as though he'd nearly pinched it from gavin but gavin then came through um he would have played for for bandon grammar his cousin liam coombs has i think four appearances for munster senior team over the last couple of years uh, both of them would have played club rugby at skibbereen uh, Liam went to Christians in the city, CBC Cork, uh, who'd be obviously kind of a rugby powerhouse for the Leaving Cert cycle, whereas Gavin uh, remained at, at Bandon Grammar, who in the last probably, was it five years ago, four years ago, they became what you'd call an A school in that they compete in the Monster School Senior Cup. Um, and they got to a semi final, I think, as well in, in 2017. And Bandon has been a a key part, I think, of West Cork's emergence as this rugby hotbed. And we can get into that in a while, if you like, you know, the, the influence of Reggie Son and the remarkable story of this French coach coming over from literally from the top level of, of French rugby to um, start a movement in, in this corner of uh, in this corner of Ireland. Um, but all in all, as you say, it is a huge achievement for the region. And I think uh, credit must be paid to people on the ground in the region people working at grassroots level at these individual clubs at these schools who are nurturing talent now to the point that where in the past we would have probably perceived Monster Rugby as being kind of like split between Cork players and Limerick players I honestly think West Cork will have its own sort of faction now and will be part of that conversation. It's it's diversifying anyway in that you have more players from, say, Waterford. Like, Waterford are doing great things as well. Jack O'Donoghue being uh, front and centre there. But I think if you looked at, look at a, a breakdown of influential Munster players over the next decade and more, it's going to be probably Cork, Waterford, West Cork, uh, and probably Limerick, actually, to a lesser extent. They're actually struggling to produce players in Limerick for various reasons. So... Yeah, going back to what you said at the start, just so exciting to see. Um, and what, what it will do as well, will it should inspire a sort of a self-perpetuating, um, a self-perpetuating kind of legacy, if you like. Uh, you know, Finneen Wisherly credits Darren Sweetenham, uh, a Don Manway man who came through a band of grammar, as being the, you know, lighting the... Is it lighting the touch paper? Is that the phrase? But like basically starting all of this because he went on to play for Munster. Obviously, he, he was a remarkable hurler, superb hurler, played for the Cork Seniors, was a massive loss to Cork hurling, but went on to play for Munster, became a professional sports person, you know, earned his Ireland caps. He's been blighted by injury. I mean, he's one of the most talented backs I've ever seen produced in Irish rugby. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that. But to see one guy break the mould, I think, did... Uh, light the torch and now you've got this conveyor belt of talent coming through and 
the more and more of those guys that come through we have i haven't even mentioned say jack crowley who's incredibly highly regarded another abandoned man hasn't quite made the the first team breakthrough yet but definitely will this season the more and more of those that we see breakthrough the more and more that should come from from beneath them as well and um listen i think uh, west cork rugby is is up and running in a major way you think of West Cork, I suppose, from a sporting perspective, a lot of it's a lot of people see it as a GA stronghold, football territory. But like you mentioned there, Gavin, it's becoming a hotbed of rugby talent at the moment. And I see there on, on on Twitter, the West Cork Mafia is kind of it trends every time Munster play now that this this phrase has been born and definitely these West Cork lads are causing wreck. And what they're doing, they're making their presence felt. Like you said, Gavin Coombe scored two tries the last day, you know, kind of Darren Sweetnam has been there the last number of years. Finine Witchley has been in with Andy Farrell's Ireland only was it two weeks ago for training. So these fellas, they're not just making up their numbers, they're actually making their presence felt and they're, they're really putting their hands up to get selected for Munster right now. I think they're going to become quintessential parts of that team. Finine Witchley has been knocking on the door, I think, for a starting position for the last probably 18 months. If you go back to, God, was it December 2018 at this stage? Or maybe it was winter, you know, winter, spring 2019. Leinster came down to Thoman Park and which lead, um, I think, and introduced himself to Irish rugby with this massive hit on Johnny Sexton, where Sexton rips the scrum cap off his head. He clearly wasn't happy with it. Perfectly legitimate challenge. And which was just letting the boss man know that, that he had arrived, you know, and Munster won that game, which was, was incredibly influential in it. And I think when you look at some of the guys coming through now, all of them are in their early 20s, apart from Sweets. Like, Sweetenham is, is maybe 27, around my own age. But these are guys that have always been perceived as being ones for the future. And yet it sort of feels like, for Munster, the future is now, in that it's time to start to integrate them into first team. Because if you look at what uh, Johan van Graan has done over the first couple of years, there has been a reticence to play you younger players to try and... I guess, um, intertwine some of the, the academy prospects within the first team squad. It's it's generally been a fairly settled selection, uh, much to some fans' chagrin and also I think to the detriment of some players in that maybe you have guys that have been underperforming on occasion where they're just a little bit too comfortable in their slots. Like They pretty much know that for a European game, their starting berth is secured and what these West Cork lads now were, uh, not only the West Cork lads, but even the likes of Craig Casey from Limerick and so on at Scrum Half, but because there are so many West Cork lads, it's incredibly prevalent with them. What they're doing is not only really knocking on the door, but actually, I think, performing to the point that they're no longer ignorable and they're no longer seen as being prospects or guys for a couple of years' time when the likes of Peter Romani uh, and the likes of Conor Murray step away. They're seen now as guys that can actually bolster what Munster are trying to do this season. And I think the head coach, Van Gran, given the relative shortcomings over the last couple of years where they didn't make it out of the pool in Europe in the season just gone, they still haven't gotten over that sort of semi-final hump. They can't seem to beat Leinster when it matters. I don't think Van Grant has a choice but to start to take what he might see as risks but what a lot of people in Munster see as an inevitability and actually the right thing to do in trying to give these guys more opportunities because when they are given the opportunities as you say just like the weekend they tend to stick their hands up and really take them. I think it's important too Gavin that these are homegrown kind of kind of local lads who are putting their hands up and playing at Munster like you mentioned there it's kind of self-perpetuating it kind of it'll encourage the next generation of players coming up behind them. But young young boys and girls across West Cork, they've, they've seen Darren Sweetenham, but now they've seen Liam and Gavin Coombs who are in with Skib, Josh and Finneen out from Bentry, um, like you mentioned there, Jack Crowley with Bendon. They've seen these these young young lads that they know, and they've seen them kind of go from West Cork up along that path to Munster. So it's going to encourage more and more young sports people around West Cork and another another place around Munster to kind of follow this path and kind of they show, they, they, they've shown it is achievable. You can go from from Camol outside Bantry to Thomond Park. Absolutely, it it's fascinating. You know, my grandfather's from Bantry, and I was saying to you before we we came on that I've been going down to Balaliki since I was six weeks old every summer, and I've spent a lot of time down there over the years and. 
listen, the, the Bantry Blues are the heartbeat of, of that community in a sporting context, and understandably. And when you look, like, it, it, the biggest moment in Bantry sport in the last, let's say, 10 years, apart from, like, some of the Blues' very important results over that period of time, was the Cork homecoming in, in 2010. And you wrote a brilliant piece about it a, a couple of months back, maybe three or four months back, about the the excitement in the community um, as the Cork team, led by Graham Canty, came back with Sam Maguire and, and the sort of, um, I guess, the sense of, of achievement and, and pride in Bantry in that they had produced a man who was so quintessential to this success and here was the entire team and it was just this remarkable occasion. And I think what you're seeing now with these guys going on to become like listen whether you go on to captain cork or become a quote-unquote professional sports person i think is kind of on a par um i i wouldn't necessarily say that uh, just because you're a professional sports person it supersedes captain in cork in any way but it's again it's just i think people's exposure to them in that they're on tv be it tg car or air sport or whatever and hopefully you know getting european runouts on bt and so on and you see this pathway as you say for young people watching it they see the wishleys they see the coombs um they will hopefully see jack crowley they've watched sweetenham uh harden it will be will be massive and they look at it and go in the past you know the the trend has been you you continue to play however many sports you're playing throughout your youth and then around 16 you probably focus on one and invariably in West Cork it'll it, well maybe not invariably but usually it's going to be Gaelic football I know like Finneen Wishley has already said that what he's noticed probably with his own peer group and maybe with Josh's peer group as well a couple of years younger and even younger than that again is that that change over now at 16 where young athletes start to focus on one sport more often more often than not in the people that they know people are actually f- focusing on rugby at 16 and it's Gaelic football that's being parked uh, or or you know soccer hurling whatever but that there has been this kind of culture shift really quite a seismic culture shift in that people from West Cork definitely Bantry are looking at rugby as maybe not as a potential career but as a sport worth pursuing into their 20s and that will inevitably lead to to more of these guys coming through like the the i guess what what you have at around 16 17 is a sort of a bottleneck and generally speaking it's only been gaelic football that has kind of made it through and now what we're probably seeing is a lot of of rugby filtering through as well and as you say people seeing what these young guys are doing sensing an opportunity for themselves and actually probably for the first time beginning to harbor dreams of playing for their province you know i guess one of the the massive um tantalizing tantalizing prospects in continuing to play ga if you're good is that you might one day get to line out and play for your county and now that we have west cork guys coming through and, and representing monster at provincial level it's it, it's kind of on a similar keel and it is a bit of a carrot that's being dangled in front of of young people who do face that choice whether i focus on football focus on rugby to see guys uh, playing for Munster, playing in Europe, um, it's bound to bound to tempt more of them in that direction. What's probably helped as well, Gavin, is even the general profile of rugby in West Cork has risen over the last couple of years. We'd banned in winning Division One of the Munster Junior League a couple of years ago, and they won a Munster Junior Cup. We've had Skibbereen win an underage All Ireland under eighteen and a half two years ago. I think Bandon have won an under sixteen and an under eighteen in the last couple of years. It's like it's not just at a Munster level. It's right across um, West Cork that the standard is rising. Even ladies rugby for a second. Um, in your brain from Skibbereen and, and Laura Sheen from Orhan both started for Ireland in the Six Nations last week in the win against Italy. So it's like the sport is really growing right across the area. Absolutely. I, like I said that earlier that a, a massive amount of credit has to go to the people on the ground and it does. Um, but I do think also it's been a concerted effort and a conscious effort by Munster to try to extend their net beyond the more traditional catchment areas for rugby. So even when I was growing up, like I'm, I'm 28, if I go back 10, 13, 15 years, back to Munster's heyday and also when I was in school and I went to Christians in town, uh, which is... In, in the city, sorry, which is uh, traditionally a rugby school. They've won more Munster School Senior Cups than anybody else. And second to them is is the rival school, Prez, across the city. I think it's 30 and 29, respectively. And it would be those two, Munchins and Limerick, maybe a little bit of Art School Reach, um, 
Crescent and then Rockwell and Tip, uh, a massive kind of fee paying school, which used to be a boarding school. And that really was the, the I guess that was the academy, if you like. Uh, that was Munster's um, means of, it, it was their talent production line. And really, anybody outside of that was a bit of an anomaly. I mean, go back to the years of John Hayes and what an unbelievable player he was for Munster in Ireland. John Hayes was from Brough. He took up rugby late and he didn't go to one of those schools. And he was genuinely seen as a total statistical and circumstantial anomaly. That's no longer the case now. And I think it's a result of Munster looking to integrate themselves a little bit more in terms of um, community development officers and so on. Now, they don't have quite the same level of resources in that front as Leinster, who have managed to do this on an even grander scale again, where you've got, say, Sean O'Brien from Offaly as one example, but loads of examples now of guys coming through. We saw uh, Will Connors is, is a Wexford man, I believe, who, who was man of the match for Ireland at the weekend. And they're really manage, managing to... I get it sounds sort of sort of sinister, and I don't mean to be, but harvest the entire province for potential rugby talent. Munster have have begun to do this in West Cork, particularly, and also in Waterford, to whom I, or to which I alluded earlier. And I think when you have, see, there, it's it's almost um, it's not quite tangential. It's not that just because Munster are doing this, there is a, a rise in the fortunes of West Cork clubs, because again, that comes back to the people working in the clubs, uh, the, the volunteers, the unbelievable individuals that are uh, heading down to, to club grounds on, on Saturday mornings to train under 10s, under 12s, whatever. But there is a kind of a causal connection or some kind of a Venn diagram, definitely, whereby Munster are um, trying to get their affairs in order to the point that more of this county of Cork and more of the province generally is available to them as a means of producing talent for uh, the professional team, for the senior team and the women's team as well. Um, and, you know, it, I think their investment, even their sort of, now that there will be a financial investment as well, but I guess their investment of attention uh, it probably does have a bit of a knock-on effect in that if you have community development officers looking at clubs going like, listen, we can do something here, we can this club can produce players then it might give the volunteers the people involved in clubs for years that little bit of a, um, a spurring on to not even not not necessarily give more than they've always been given but it, it might give them a sense of direction and just open pathways and make things a little bit more clear in how they can assist that process so what I'm trying to say in a very long-winded way maybe it's a kind of a, a rising tide lifts all boats sort of phenomenon that's happening Monster are involved but, you know, if again, if you had to point to, to anybody as being the, the real catalyst for all of this, I'd just point towards the people working at the clubs who have, in fairness, watched in the last, um, in the, you know, 2000s, watched Munster become this unbelievable Irish sports story, this European power in rugby. Um, and, it, and it take, you know, for that success to translate into... Um, the doors being opened in, in places like West Cork and Waterford and Clare and Kerry and so on. It does take time as well. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a, um, it, it, it might be kind of a delayed reaction to that or just the natural reaction to that, plus the efforts of people on the ground, plus the efforts of Munster themselves. And as you say, you see all of these clubs now enjoying their, their successes. I think Bantry Bay or FC, we've spoken about the Witchley brothers there. Um, I think their women's team won a monster championship maybe two years ago as well. So it's not just the men, it's the women as well. And it's amazing to see. It's 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 like I'm following it from, I don't want to say afar, like I'm not, I'm not too far away. I'm in Rochestown, but it's been a really enjoyable thing to follow in the Southern Star and elsewhere just to see not only one club have these um, amazing journeys the way Bandon had a couple of years ago, but actually you know, four, five, six clubs. And it seems similar to what we're hoping will happen with the conveyor belt of talent in terms of players. It seems as though one club's success in West Cork tends to be matched or bettered. And, um, and maybe there's that little effect as well of competition and wanting to keep up with the neighbours. You kind of mentioned earlier, Gavin Coombs, is something that you think that there's not enough hype about. Maybe that, that'll probably come. But you mentioned there, the Witcherleys, the Coombs, is Darren Sweetenham. Who excites you the most, Jack Crowley? Which fella are you looking at there over this 
current West Cork crop and saying that fella has something there. He could go very, very far. Without putting too much pressure on their broad, broad shoulders. I know. Well, uh, Jesus, they're hefty men. Like, they'll be all right, you know. But um, you know what? It's a very difficult one to answer because I'm... Ah, oh, it sounds so diplomatic and, like, I'm on the fence. But I am really excited about all of them. I, I'm... Let me think now. If I had to... I'd say if I had to pick one, I'd actually pick John Hodnett. Uh, just on the basis that I think he's... He nearly has a, a a disregard for his own well-being. And I know that sometimes isn't a great thing in rugby, but in terms of how he carries the ball, in terms of how he uh, jackals, uh, as in uh, looks to turn the ball over in rocks, he's a, a physical specimen, He's got, but he's quick. He just brings a lot of ballast, which is what Munster have been missing. Gavin Coombs, you could say the same thing. Like, I'm kind of excluding Wishley from this because I think he's a little bit more established and I think it is well established that he is going to be a, a key player for Munster going forward. I haven't I haven't seen, I can't pretend to have seen a great deal of Josh, but I know he's incredibly highly rated there. Um, with Crowley, I think it's interesting because what we've seen with Munster over the last three weeks since the Pro 14 came back is that there's been a little bit of changing of the guard at out half with JJ Hanrahan uh, from Kerry being replaced now in the starting lineup by Ben Healy, who is, I think, a year Crowley senior. And they would have been part of the same conversation, basically. The conversation being, you know, who's the next in line to Joey Carberry, provided he's fit, or who is the guy if Carberry isn't fit, which he isn't at the moment. It's a little bit harsh on Hanrahan, but it's probably a reality that he's not quite going to take Monster to the next level at this point, even though he's a very, very good player in his own right. And Crowley obviously hasn't had the opportunity yet to kind of wriggle his way in ahead of Healy. Clearly, they, they've just fancy Healy for the moment, but I think Healy is a little bit further on in terms of his physical de- development. He's a big guy anyway, you know. And it was interesting to see, actually, in a recent A game, they played, he. I think they played Healy at 10, but they played Crowley at 12 inside centre, so just outside about half so that they could interlink and without meaning to get too technical or, or bogged down into the intricacies of rugby uh, there is a kind of a trend at the moment in the world game where in having a a second playmaker or an option at first receiver outside of the out half uh, is becoming paramount so people will um, hopefully it doesn't sound like gobbledygook but if people have been watching England for the last couple of years for example they'll have noticed George Ford will start at 10 often and Owen Farrell who's traditionally an out half might play at 12 and you just have this little um, this potential interlinking between out half and centre and it just gives you this option of, of being more expansive and also taking a little bit of pressure off the out half and allowing him to allowing him or her to be able to affect play further at the field and maybe that could be an option for Crowley um, that he could go in at, at 12 and nearly combine with Healy in the years to come although it's funny because that's that seems to be the direction they're going or at least it's something they're trying at the moment but when I speak to people in Munster they're very high on both Healy and Crowley but some of the people I've spoken with are more excited about Crowley than they are about Healy which Munster fans listening will be will be hopefully excited by because I think everybody is really enthused by what we've seen from Healy so far. So, Hodnett, to answer your question, Hodnett would probably be the guy, I'm nearly flipping a coin or, or kind of uh, picking a number there, but I also can't wait to see Crowley make that breakthrough and, and just see what he can do because we saw it with the Ireland 20s. He's a mercurial talent. He's, he's got a little bit of everything. Reminds me a bit of Jack Carty at Connacht um, in that he's just a little bit different to what Ireland I think have out out half across all of the provinces at the moment and if you can refine that and really nurture that talent he could turn into something special Dragons are next up for Munster I think it's this Sunday can we expect that of those West Cork fellas they did enough last Monday night to keep their their place in the starting team this weekend Absolutely who's going to be arguing with the West Cork Mafia at this point I think uh, they're they're going to be fairly central to it again Um yeah, it's hard to know. It's difficult to know how much Van Grand will change it. Obviously, there are a lot of players away with the international uh, window at the moment. And that does leave you not not down to the bare bones by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, it limits your, your ability to make changes probably without wanting to throw in too many young guys or too many debutants and so on. So yeah, I, I'd, I'd expect the five that played last weekend, provided they're all fit during the week, to feature again. I don't know how many will start. I mean, 
is there an argument maybe for all five starting this time and even Josh Wishley starting who knows but yeah I'd imagine they'll they'll be involved and I'm trying to think I mean it's it's unlikely I would say that Crowley will be involved given JJ Hanron was quite influential when he came on for Healy uh, last weekend his time will come later in the season though no doubt about it um I'm just trying to think, is there any anybody else that I'm leaving out? I don't think so at the moment. That would be, as in, that would be in the conversation for for featuring this weekend. It's onwards and upwards. So for the for the West Cork Mafia, who are making their presence felt with Munster. Gavin, thank you so much for, for taking time out to have a chat with us here on the Star Sport Podcast. And we, we hope that Clint Gareth is kind to you. I can see the sun shining in the window there. So um, it looks like the, the weather is pretty good at the moment. So thank, thanks for your time, Gavin. Thanks a million, Kieran. And... Uh, Glengarve is never not kind, I think. Access Credit Union has always been at the heart of our community through good and bad times. We want to continue to play our part in helping our community through the COVID-19 crisis. As businesses reopen, we encourage our community to work together by staying local, borrowing locally and spending locally. Access Credit Union is here to help. Welcome back to the Star Sport Podcast and before we wrap up this week's show we're going to quickly preview what's to come in this week's Southern Star. Kieran, we already talked in depth about your special feature on the 25th anniversary of Bantry Blues winning their first county title. What else can readers expect this week? There's a lot going on in this week's sports section, Jack. Like you mentioned there, three-page feature and Bantry Blues 95 county success. Um, I caught up with Cork footballer Laura O'Mahony, who injured her cruciate earlier this year, and she's sitting out the all our ladies' championship. So I had a good catch-up with Laura to see how the rehab is going. And funnily enough, well, not funnily enough for Laura, but she doesn't know when exactly she injured her cruciate, which is kind of um, strange in itself. So good stuff there with Laura O'Mahony from Skibbereen. A full page interview too with Cork Camogie's Laura Tracy because the Cork Camogie team is kicking off their All Ireland Championship campaign this weekend against Wexford. We're also looking ahead to the Munster Senior Hurling semi final between Cork and Waterford this weekend. We have an interview with Owen Cadigan and also Kieran Kingston, the Cork Hurling manager. Dennis Hurley's column this week is on Cork City, who were relegated from the Premier Division last weekend. So good stuff as always. Um, from Dennis Hurley on this. He's a he's a man with his finger on the pulse when it comes to Cork City. So essential reading here for any Cork City fan. Keeping it local, um, Tom Lyons has picked his all-star 15 from the Carberry Junior A Football Championship. And it'll be no surprise that Kilmackaby dominates this team. But they've only seven of the 15 places. So you'll have to check out Thursday Star to see what 15 players he has picked. Um Court at Sherry Soccer and um, adult team is also back this year, and Jer McCarthy has caught up with them for a lovely feature about the importance of Court Mac getting back into West Cork League. And Jack, the 43 senior adult players registered for for their campaign, which is phenomenal, kind of for a for a team in in the championship. And in our rugby page this week, we have. I suppose a tale of um, Laura Sheehan and Inya Breen, who starred for Ireland in the Six Nations last week, and also how Bendon Rugby Club is keeping going during the current lockdown and how they want their senior players to coach the underage team. So great stuff from Bendon Rugby there. And also, like, like I've said, it's action-packed this week. Our motorsport read this week by Martin Walsh is really good as well. He's looking back at the, the Marine Hotel in Glendore, which has been um, which was a sponsor and host of the Facet Rally for, for 17 years. So it's a really good piece by Martin looking back and how how special that time um, around the Marine Hotel and the Facet Rally was. So just from that alone, Jack, you can see there's loads going on in, in this week's Southern Star Sports section. So it's well worth picking up this Thursday. Yeah, absolutely jam-packed as always, Kieran. I look forward to getting stuck into that tomorrow morning. And you can too, if you want to just go to a shop in West Cork or some shops around the country, which also stock to Southern Star, you can read it for two twenty. And if you can't make it to a shop, you can always subscribe online to our e-paper and read the Southern Star on your computer, tablet, or smartphone for less than two euro per week. Just go on to www.southernstar.ie forward slash e-paper. But let's leave it there for this week now, Kieran. Thanks for listening to the Star Sport Podcast. We'll be back. At the same time next week, if you enjoy these shows, please make sure to rate, review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, 
YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Slán